and instead of evaluating exponential of a, what I really want to do is exponential of a times t. So just a slight modification of this definition. So how does that work? So if that's a, some scalar t times a is just going to be t times the multiplication. So you get t times lambda k zero. So that's t to the a to the power of one. What does that pattern look like if we keep raising the exponent? So t a squared is just this matrix times this matrix. Right, simple two by two multiplication, and then you know how to do this. So this is simply t squared lambda squared, t squared lambda plus t squared lambda, zero t squared, t squared lambda squared. So if I keep doing this to the cube, to the four, to the fifth, you develop a pattern that you can control. So all the way to the, let's say, k phase, you can confirm that you get something like t lambda k, k t lambda, lambda to the k minus 1, 0, t to the lambda. So third power, fourth power. So now, I know what t a to the k is, therefore I know what t a to the k over k factorial is, and then I know what exponential of t times k. So therefore, Exponential of TA, which is really the quantity I want. Yes? Uh, it maybe it's not T to the power of lambda. Maybe it's T to the power of lambda. <laughs> so, just by evaluating the definition, taking the exponential now, I'll get to we how to do this. So, you get, as we saw last time, very interestingly, you get each entry in this matrix is an infinity. T lambda to the k over k factorial. I should make this bigger. I will not close the braces until I'm confident that I have enough room. T k equals 0 to infinity. T lambda to the k over k factorial. You don't get zero here. And once again, k equals zero to the infinity. T lambda to the k. That's a big number. And of course, you know each one of these policies, but they are because they're just the exponent. So this becomes exponential of t times lambda, t times the exponential of t times lambda, zero exponential of t times lambda. So I could have started with this instead of having you laboriously go to the second dimensional cases of the matrices, because this is applicable to any dimension. But I wanted you to get a flavor for what we're going to do later, so that's all. But anyway, I'm not done. I, I, but this is the answer. Okay, this is the explanation. Okay, so what though? What, what difference is that possibly? I need my answer. So we know how to do this exponential of a matrix. It's just taking the matrix to some power and applying the infinity that you know from your practice. So that's great. But let me augment this now with some further properties. So let me give you a proposition. Name it the following. So if B, let's say some vector, in Rn, and call this an eigenvector, I've been told that I should write bigger. 
So I'm trying my best, but it's not easy. Associated to lambda are eigenvalues. Then my claim is that V is also an eigenvector of the exponential of the matrix associated to the eigenvalue e to the left. So if v is an eigenvector of a, then v is also an eigenvector of the exponential of a, associated to e to the left. And I can prove this to you very simply. I, I don't want to spend too much time on proofs, but things we can do in modern line, we should do. Oh, the proof is there is. If in fact V is an eigenvector of A and lambda is an eigenvector, then it must be true that A that must be. But then that implies that the exponential of A times V, which is the quantity that I'm interested in. I can write this, if you remember from your calculus, as the limit as n goes to infinity of the following expression. K is equal to 0 to n. A k v over k. That's an alternate way of specifying, of specifying the estimate. If you remember it from Okay. But I know what a to, a to the k times v is because that's just the eigenvalue relation. So I can write this as limit as n goes to infinity of what? Still the same summation, but now I have lambda to the over k factor times v. I don't know where the extra lambda is. Probably because I don't know how to do it. But then now the summation is just over k, so I can pull out the v of the summation. So this is the same as me. And I will also now take the limit as n goes to infinity. So k is equal to 0 to infinity. Lambda to the k over k factor times v. And what is this equal to? This is straight. So this is just exponential or lambda. And that's it. Simple one line. So indeed, if V is an eigenvector of A associated with lambda, then V is also an eigenvector of A exponential. Because we get this V equal to. Okay. Let me give you one other proposition, and then I'll state the main result. You can tell I'm losing my patience over here sometimes. I want you to do this. Okay. Proposition. This is the key one. My claim is that the time derivative of this exponential matrix so d by dt of exponential of e times a, my claim is that this is equal to, as you can imagine, a times the exponential of ta, which is also equivalent to. In other words, you can write the matrix multiplication in a way. That's my proposition, that's my claim. And I will not prove this to you because it's a very easy proof. But it's, it's in voice and Dupree Mark, so you can actually see it. It's one of the few things we're doing that's actually in your textbook. <laughs> okay. So proof, another one line proof, or maybe two line proof. In voice and Dupree Mark. I think chapter seven. But that's the key result. 
And it's analogous to taking the time derivative of just any old exponential function. It's a constant just function. I've dropped three pieces of jobs in this way. But it's not good. OK, so we have two key propositions. We can find these states of main results that I should have started with two weeks ago. But as I said, I had some hidden motivation. And that goes as follows. Okay. Theorem. One can say this is the fundamental theorem of linear dynamics. And it goes like this. Let A be any n by n matrix. So 2 by 2, 3 by 3, 4 by 4, whatever. The solution to the initial value IDT with initial condition x of 0 is x0 is simply the following is x of t equal to the exponential of t times a, which is why I fussed about computing this quantity, times x0. That's the solution. So any linear system you're given, the IVP of course, x prime is equal to x. So that's the situation we always have started with, but so far I've been doing two by two cases. And then I go to the train of computing the eigenvalues, eigenvectors, but you don't have to do that anymore. Because now we know what the whole answer is for any dimension. So it's the exponential of the matrix times the initial matrix. That's the answer. And my claim is that this is the unique And in fact, the proof of this I will do because it's illustrated. requires us to use this proposition. Okay. So, from the previous proposition, we know that d by dt of exponential t times a times x0, just by this proposition, must be equivalent to x0 times d by dt of the exponential But then by the proposition, I know what this is. So this is just a times the exponential, t a times x. And of course, so finally, since we know what this quantity is, since exponential, let's say, of 0 times a, is just or times x naught. What is this quantity equal to? What is exponential 0 times a times x0? Very good. So we satisfy the initial condition. So this is the solution. We take the time derivative, that's what we get, which is equivalent to the right hand side. And indeed, it satisfies the initial condition. So we have a unique solution. That's it. I could have done this in one class, in the linear system state. But for some reason, I thought it's a bit weird to start with the exponential of a matrix. So I wanted to introduce you to it. So, Yes, the 
as long as you go to the labor of computing the exponential dimension. But this is the right answer. This is the way you should do it. But sometimes, I guess, it depends on what role you're given. Sometimes maybe it is easier just to find the eigenvalues. If you're in two by two matrix, it's sometimes easier just to write down there. Especially if it's diagonal, you know what's wrong. But it, you should note that even in that case, when we're finding eigenvalues, it's always exponential t times eigenvalue. So they're the same. You can see it's the same. We're done with this. Okay. Now I will go to the nice part of this. Not non but I need to introduce many things in this nice advanced group of students, uh, <coughs> math major, much better than the engineers. Huh? One more to do. No. I need to go back though one second and talk about the idea of flow. I guess. You know, I, it's very interesting. So now. I want to study, once again, vector x prime, but not equal to ax anymore, not generally, just that. So, this is a general system. It can be linear, nonlinear, and so on. And before, up to now, I've been dealing with the case where f is equal to a times x, but no more. So it's a dynamic system. This is what we do. But even um, in this deceptively simple thing I've written down, there's a lot of machinery behind this. One of the examples is time. The solutions, as you saw even in the linear case, evolve in time. But what does that mean? So, evolution of a dynamic. What does that mean? It means that there's a change in the state of the system with respect to time. So you have some system that's in some state, and at some other time, it's in some other state. So that's what we mean by it. But I should be more precise about what I mean by it. What do I mean by evolution? Not the biological version, the math version. <laughs> Although the two concepts are surprisingly related. But biology is people are always aloof to that. Well, I do know why they don't do math. Okay. What do I mean by it? I mean that given initial state, for lack of better terminology, let me call it x0. It's your initial condition. Vector. Remember my vector means far. We want, so if you give me just an initial state, I want to figure out what the state of the system will look like at all future times just from knowing the initial state. But is it good enough just to know the initial state? What am I missing to figure out what the state of the system will look like at a future time? More specific than that. I need something that will act on my initial state to give me the state of the system at some other time. I'm missing something. Some detail. Both, right. Why? I want, okay, let me read. We want an evolution law. That determines the state, let's say, x sub. So given initial condition, an evolution law that I apply to this initial state, I should be able to tell you what the state of that system will be at some future time. So I need both pieces of information. 
But then, we know what this evolution law is, because you know what it means to carry a solution from one state to another. And what is that operator? It's the flow. That's why I introduced it. Okay. And this operator is once again my phi t. I will explain that. And basically, how does this work? So my system at some future time, xt, is found by applying this flow operator to my initial state. This applied to that will give me this system at some future state. So I have to know what this is. Again, I know. And this phi t, for a bunch of t, so I put that in curly bit. I mean a family of phi t, is what you call last time. So when you are doing dynamical systems, really what is happening is that you give me an initial condition. You give me that evolution law, which is the flow operator. It acts upon the initial state, and it gives you the state of the system in some future. I'll make it more. Let's see if I can make this a bit more clear. So, some properties. of this flow operator, which I'll just write by because I don't want to draw it. Basically. The first proposition is that phi at time zero should just be the identity of And if you remember from your calculus course, I d of x is just x. That's what you meant for identity. The second property is the flow. Phi, so you start at phi t. Phi t plus s is some s time ahead of t, right? If my system is stayed at phi t, then phi t plus s is some future time. So the future time evolution of my system, which I denote as phi t plus s, should have this property, namely that phi t composed So then, when I apply phi t plus s to my state vector, which is x, what do I get? By this, it's just the composition of the two functions. So in this situation, it's just phi t, phi s, on x. Because you know what the composition mapping is. But then what does this mean? Let's draw that. So let's say, just in some general sense, this is my plane or base portrait or something like that. If I start from x0, my initial state, and I want to go to my final state, which is xt, and in between these two I stop at some intermediate state, let's say xs, this means that the evolution is completely deterministic. I can obtain xt from xs, but I can also obtain it from x here. That's what I'm saying. So it's a composition. You can get from your initial state to your final state, either by going straight or by a composition of time. So what I'm saying is that this evolution then is completely deterministic. That's what I'm trying to say. This evolution is deterministic. Obviously, if you go from here, I apply phi s, and if you go from there, you apply phi s. What do I mean by deterministic? Say that again. It's determined, even though if you don't calculate it, it has one path. Yes. So it 
means that if I know the initial state and I know the evolution operators, I know deterministically exactly what the state of the system will be at any future. Um, if you have stochastic variation, then we need to do a whole different course. It's called stochastic differential equation. We will do that next week. I won't do it, you will do it. But all of physics, most of biology, rely on this idea. It is deterministic equations. So Newton's equations, deterministic. Maxwell's equations, deterministic. Einstein's equations, deterministic. That's why physics is physics. It's laws of nature. So all laws of nature are deterministic laws of nature. Okay? The idea is that, once again, if I give you an initial state, and I give you the evolution law or the equation, you can tell me what the future time is, what the future state is at any specific time, because it's determined. So even in our case, our linear system, the flow in this case is just x naught. So the idea is you know if I apply this now to some future state, you know what the future state of the system is. Because you know the evolution law, and you have an initial position. So it's the same thing. So that's, that's the ground we are on now, on this question. And any questions about this? The, the more interesting question now is, which I won't get into too much, but if I give you a final state, can you tell me what the initial state is? So if I give you just a final state and I ask you, what did this state look like initially? Can you do it? I can do it. You can do it for linear system, but in general it cannot be done because it could be that your flow. If you remember, it could be that it's not uh, inverse. In, the inverse is not uniform. So it's much harder in nonlinear systems to construct the initial state from the past, which is a huge problem in cosmology. Anyway, so does everybody understand this one? No. All right. So I'm surprised, though. Let me go back to what I wrote down. <coughs> I'm surprised about something that nobody brought up. Even Gates has been silent. He was in pain. When I wrote this down, or even when I wrote down the uh, linear phase, and I'm telling you that this is about state vectors evolving and solutions evolving, how come nobody's asked me where are these solutions evolving? Like I wrote down this thing, and I got a solution, but nobody's asked me the question where are the solutions evolving? What is the background space? What is the geometry? How come nobody does this? Where do you assume the solutions are evolving? You should ask this question when you're when you're given a differential equation, even in the non-systems case. Where is the solution evolving? I can write down the solution like I just put there, but where is this happening? Mathematically, any idea? So there's some hint here. I have some point that represents an initial state, and it goes to another state at some time t. So this is my space that I'm working with. I can represent, if I represent different states at different times as, as points in this set, then this could be a space of evolution, which I call the state space. That's a question I'm, I, nobody has ever. And it's the most important question. So, very abstractly now, if I just think of states of these systems as different points in some space, then this space, if you can imagine, contains every single possible evolutionary state of this system at any time. Every point in this system. 
That's why we call it a space space. Because this space collectively represents every possible configuration that your system of equations can be. So we call that a space space. But then what is a space space? Is it RM? Is it something more general than this? Any idea? Not a one. Okay. That's okay. I didn't expect it. What I call my state space in general is what we call the manifold. So I told you last time, to understand differential equations properly, you need to do linear algebra, vector calculus, and not the whole. But I will do it nicely. I will not make it hard for you. I will try. Okay. But does everybody understand what I'm saying? So if I just generically denote this as my state space, then points in this space represent your system at any point in time. So sometimes it's here, sometimes it's here, etc. Et yes? Does um, are the manifolds the same as the path matrix or don't have um, Metrics give manifolds their structure. But in generic, in generic terms, you don't need to use the metrics. So, for this, so generally, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to? Exactly. We won't have to. That's a good question. But then, how, how would you know if it's a long how would I know that? Because it, didn't you kind of give it coordinates by saying it's x naught and then it goes to x Ah, oh, so we'll, we'll get to this. We'll get to this. I've not actually told you anything about the distances between the two points. I need to introduce a metric on a manifold, but I'm talking about distances between the two points. But I'm not doing that. I'm being more general. But does everybody understand what I'm saying? More or less? So this generic kind of space and points in the space represent my state of my system at any other time. So sometimes it's here, it could be here, it could be here, it could be here. That's what it is. But I want to quantify this somehow. It's too abstract, it's just a circle with some points in it. This is what we call a state space, and in general, a state space is what we call a system. So I need to describe this. So let me do that. So, I guess you can call this the idea of, actually, do I want to give it a idea? Yeah, maybe. Topological. Now, I assume you've not done this in uh, multivariate look at this, correct? Uh, topology. No, okay. Okay. okay, so what do I mean by topological space? What does this mean? It's very easy. Do not get caught up in the terminology. The concept is actually very easy. So, consider a set M. So, some set called M. And let me denote by T a family of subsets of M. So let me consider some set M, and by T I mean a family of subsets of M. So every possible subset of M, make it into a collection and denote that collection by T. Okay, and it's helpful to think of T, or maybe of M, M as a collection of points as I just did this. Okay. So consider set M, which is the same idea as this set here. Okay. And T is a family of subsets of this M, so subsets of this, so something like, like that. So subsets of this. And M is helpful to think of as a collection of points. Okay. So that's the first thing to say. Okay. 
we denote the pair, the pair, M comma T. We denote this as a topological space. If the following things are true. Number one, the empty set, so this is not the flow operator, it's the empty set. So maybe I should write it with a diagonal line or something. Like that. The empty set. So everybody knows what I mean by empty set, right? I assume you've seen it. The empty set and M are members of T. Number two, the union of any selection of elements of T is also in T. So, if T is in my collection of subsets of M, and I take a union of any subsets of those, that union must also be in T as well. So one must be true, two must be true, and there's another one as well. A third one. The third one. The intersection any finite number of elements of T is also in T. So, if M and T is a topological space, if 1 is true, 2 is true, and 3 is true, and if these three things are true, then we say that the family slash collection T defines what we call a topology. Any questions about this? Just, just definitions. No. So, given these facts, we will come now to perhaps the most important concept of this, and it's very simple. We cannot do dynamical systems or any type of differential equation if what I'm about to write down is not true. And I mean the following. I define a neighborhood of an element. So remember, I said it's helpful to think of M as a collection of forms. So an element of M is just a form. So a neighborhood of an element, call that element P. P for points, it helps you remember. Okay. Element P of M is a set which I would denote as U of P containing an open set for which of which P is an element. So what I 
mean is that if I have some set here and I have some point, I can draw an open set around P, which P is in there. This dashed line, if you remember from your calculus course, means open set around P. So that's what I mean by neighborhood of a point. You see? So P is my point, the neighborhood of this point is within some vicinity of some open set around P. say some set A, union B, where A and B are elements of P, such that their intersection is non-empty. So, A intersect B um, is equal to the empty set. Then they don't intersect. So, further, let me just, in the last minute, see to tell you where I'm going with this. special name Hausdorff. And what that means, if you manage on this Hausdorff, what that means is that any two points can be separated by distinct neighborhoods. my space M, and I have some points here, I can separate any two points by distinct neighborhoods. They never intersect. So I can draw that, 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 and so So if your manifold or your space is such that any two distinct points can be separated by neighborhoods and they don't intersect, then this manifold is called Hausdorff. That's right. Yes. If M is connected, M. If M is connected, M is what we call also H A U S D O R. And all that means is that any two points can be separated by them. So you see the way I've drawn it is none of the open sets intersect. So that's very important. So all the manifolds that we will deal with in this course are also. Yes. Would the basis of the be the same for all of them? I can show. It doesn't have to be. They should not connect, exactly. Now, and the most important thing is that the open set should be a neighborhood of a point. So some vicinity, it does not matter what. It's an abstraction. Okay, I, I will continue with this on 